I'd like to uh, invite us to uh, just uh, pray with me right now. And I want to ask the Lord to bless this time as we get into his word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that you are at work. You're at work in Japan and you're at work here. And God, as we have been learning about what it means to uh, posture ourselves to receive your blessing, I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts and minds right now. Speak to each one of us, for each of us comes to this service and to this place and time uh, in a different condition. Lord, but you can meet each one of us where we're at. Thank you, Lord. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have been in this wonderful uh, book of Matthew where he lays out what's called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes, that's a Latin word, it comes from a Latin word, and it just means blessed. And all of us want to be blessed. I don't think there's anybody here who says, don't bless me, God. But in fact, most of us, when we pray, somewhere along uh, the line in our prayers, we will ask God for his blessing on us. It's very natural. It's very good. It's very appropriate for us to want to receive the blessing of God. When you look at the Beatitudes, though, they kind of surprise us in that we would not think that those who are, for example, poor in spirit, or those who mourn, or the meek, or those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, or even the merciful would be blessed. And yet, those are the people that it says will be blessed by God. Today, we're looking at those who are pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8 says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, when Jesus spoke of those who are pure in heart, uh, he was addressing that inner life of people. It's not the outward actions that's in view right now. It's that inner part of our lives. It's that, that, um, that part of us that uh, has to do with the way we think, has to do with the things that we feel, has to do with uh, the motivations of our heart, why we do the things that we do. To be pure means that we are clean. There's, there's no division. There's, there's wholeness there within our hearts. To be pure in heart means that we are guiltless before the Lord. Now, as we think about this idea of being pure in heart, what I want to focus in on is a couple of areas of that inner life of ours. The first one I, I think that's significant is for our thought life. How we think. Because how we think will go a long way in determining our emotions and our actions. Purity in our thought life is what I'd like to focus on right now. And there's a verse out of Philippians 4.8 that I think is very significant for us to capture. It says this, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this passage directs our minds towards the things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Now, sometimes when we consider our thought life we might have the notion, well, we can't really help what we think about, right? We might kind of conceive of this idea that, well, just thoughts come into our hearts and minds. And, you know, we're kind of almost like a victim of our own selves. We could feel like we're not in control. Let's consider the person who just is a constant worrier. Do you know, don't raise your hands, do you know anybody who constantly worries? That they seem like they are always fearful about what's gonna happen next. There's a sense of dread that they live with and that fear sort of permeates the way they relate to family members and friends. It controls the way they, or the things that they do or the things that they won't do. 
they're told by others, don't worry about it. And it really doesn't help because they consistently just worry and think about these things that cause them to fret. And if you press into them, they will say, I'm not trying to worry. But in that expression, they're also in a way saying, I can't help it. Almost as if they're saying, this is who I am. But that's not true. They are not a victim. See, the implication of this passage is that we can choose what our minds dwell on. And here's, this is significant. There's a difference between what we think about and having just a passing thought. See, when Paul commands us to think about the things that are true, that are right, that are pure, things like that, he's talking about what you choose to set your mind out, what you choose to ponder upon, what you choose to reflect upon. He's not talking about those passing thoughts that might come to our mind from time to time, which it is hard to control. But you can control what you choose to dwell on, what you choose to reflect upon, what you choose to reason about. I think it's funny or interesting that Paul doesn't command us to not think about all the negative things all around us. I mean, have you ever tried not to think about something? It just doesn't work. Like, for example... I want us right now not to think about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Don't think about it. Don't think about the red nose. Don't think about him flying in the air. Don't think about him flying, you know, leading the sleigh and all that. Don't think about Rudolph. Don't think about the song that's about him. It just doesn't work. The command isn't to not think about all of the negative things and the impure things around us, but instead is to focus our minds on the things that are true, on the things that are noble, the things that are right, the things that are pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. Those are the things that the Lord tells us to focus our minds on, to reflect upon, to mull over. So this begs the question, if part of having a pure heart has to do with having pure thoughts, and if having pure thoughts has to do with what we focus our attention upon, then it begs the question, what are we focusing our hearts and minds on? What do we fill our minds with? What is it that occupies our time and our attention a good question to ask is are you more committed to your favorite television program than you even are to the word of god in your life see because the word of god it fills us and causes us to focus our attention on the things that are true the things that are noble and right the things that are pure and lovely and admirable, the things that are excellent and praiseworthy. That's one of the wonderful things about being in the Word of God. And some of us, if we're honest, we are more committed to our favorite television program than we are the Word of God. And what is it that we are watching? Let me ask that. Think about that. Your favorite program that you watch most faithfully, what does it promote? You know, we talk about those who worry to those who feel like they're going, you know, the shoe's going to drop or something dreadful is going to happen. And then you press in a little bit. And what are they feeding their minds with? Well, shows that depict a lot of murder, kidnapping, rape, all sorts of immorality. And this is what 
we're feeding our minds. And then we wonder, why are they so worried that something bad is going to happen? Well, it's because what they're being fed constantly are things that are happening that are terrible. Because we're choosing to fill our minds with those things. Here's a great question. Do you feel better or worse after watching what you watch? Do your viewing habits, do they desensitize you to the things of the world and even other people? Do you find yourself, after what you are exposing yourself to, more helpful? Do you feel your, yourself being more hopeful, I should say, or more fearful? There are people who don't realize the impact that what they're taking in has on the purity of their heart and their thought life. Some of you say, well, I don't watch TV. Okay, maybe you're a reader. What are you reading? If you look at the overall scope of the things that you take in through your reading, are those things things that are true and noble and right? and pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. Are those the types of things that you are taking in? How about your conversations? In your conversations, do you speak of the things that are true, noble, and right? What if everyone in the service, if we all made this conscious choice to talk about someone else, but you could only say that which is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy about that other person. Let's just say you made this conscious choice that when you left here, you're going to speak about somebody else, but only say those things. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be cool if that was the choice we made to dwell on those things that Paul commands us to dwell upon? It was about um, two years ago when we discovered in our home that we had this infestation of bed bugs. It was horrible. It was horrible. If you've ever had bed bugs, it's terrible. Um, one of our uh, uh, sons, he went to a uh, camp and he came back from that camp. And uh, the camp was, I think, in the month of July. And we didn't discover it until December. That means there's like five months, right? And so it's awful when, I mean, we didn't know that uh, his room had all these uh, bugs. And he was killing, he didn't know what they were. He would be killing them and and uh finally we discovered uh, we discovered them did some research on them and uh, if you've ever had bed bugs i tell you it's one of the most horrible things they're really hard to get rid of and in fact uh you have to go through this whole process and we had an exterminate come in we had to take all of our clothes out and uh, bag them up and put these poison strips in them here's a picture uh of our garage as we try to, uh, we had to clean out all the things in our, in our, you know, rooms and put them in bags. Here's another picture of another angle, more bags of all our stuff. And uh, the things that you couldn't bag up and put poison strips in, we had to take to a laundromat. And so here's, uh, here's Rita at the laundromat. She had to, uh, yeah, we went there to, to, uh, cause they, they die by heat. One of the ways they die is by heat. So we had to take a lot of the bigger items there. Um, you don't want bed bugs. It's terrible. And it, you know, when you, when we think about it, I mean, there's, there's fear in that. Oh my gosh, did we get them all? There's shame in that. Oh my goodness. What people are going to think we're, we're, you know, we have this sort of disease or something that they won't want to be around us. There's, there's all sorts of fear and shame and all that that comes with that, right? Um, also, during that time, 
praise God, we had not only one of our cars, but two of our cars were totaled on the very same incident. Our cars were parked right in front of our house. And like at two o'clock in the morning, a guy came around and sideswiped both of our cars. And they were both totaled. Praise God. Hey, really? Am I just saying that? Praise God. No, really. You see, because when I think about the bed bugs, I think about, you know what? That was awful. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But one of the things that came out of that was we got rid of a lot of junk. I mean, we decluttered that house, and that was needed. And our house was about 30 years old, and, you know, we had talked about you know, getting a new carpet and fixing it up and and doing a little remodel. And it was one of those things where you talk about, you say, yeah, we should do that someday. And you know, someday never comes, right? It's always like, yeah, we should do that. And yet, because we had cleaned out our house and everything was in the garage, we decided this is the day. We're going to do this thing because we don't want to have to move this stuff twice. And so when we think about all these bed bugs, we think, wow, that was a blessing. There was something good that actually came out of that. You know, when we got our cars sideswiped, we lost two vehicles. But someone actually then gave us a car. We got a, 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 a new used car from that. It was perfect timing for us. It was so fun. I got, and then I went out, and because of the insurance proceeds, I was able to go out and buy a little Honda Civic. It's a stick shift. I get to pretend I'm like 16 again, driving my stick shift. What a blessing. How do you choose to think about things? What do you focus on? See, because if God's word is true, and he says that he causes all things to work together for the good, I'm going to look for the good. I'm going to see what comes my way, and I'm going to see, hey, God's at work here some way. Even in the hardest situation, God is at work, and I'm going to look for that. Because his word tells us that we need to focus on that which is true, that which is noble, that which is right the things that are pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. One of the hardest days of my life was July 5th, 2013. It's the day my mom passed away. I was in the hospital. I spent the night with her and we weren't expecting her to pass away. She passed away pretty quick within a week of, of coming down with an infection. She was, I think, 83, 84. She was pretty young. Um, hardest day of my life. When you know, you, some of you have, have uh, lost a, a loved one, some of you have lost you know people so dear to you, and so I, I don't have any illusions that it's unique, especially to use, lose a parent. And yet, as you know, it's very personal. And yet, when I look at that, look at uh, her passing. You know, there's a blessing that came from that. See, because up until that point, my relationship with my mom was very, very close. Very close. In fact, my relationship with with my dad came through my mom. I would talk to my mom, and then she would talk to my dad. And one of the blessings that came with my mom's passing is that it was almost like this forcing function where I was now had to relate to my father. And over the last five years, I spent more time with my dad than I ever had before. And as he's gotten older and he's need more care, uh, our siblings, me and my siblings, we've had to spend more time with him. We had to interact with him more. We've gotten the chance to know him better. In fact, the, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, in a care facility and um, 
I was uh, at the care facility and I would, uh, they have these little balls there, these uh, plastic balls. And I was uh, playing catch with him. And it just struck me as I was playing catch with him that um, I never played catch with him when I was younger. He never threw the ball to me when I was younger. And now here I am, a 55, 56 year old man and he's in his 90s and we're playing catch. You know, I look back at my mom and I miss her every day. But I see a blessing that has come from it in that my relationship with my father has been strengthened. And I think about the reunion we're going to have in heaven. I think about the good times we've shared. There's blessing. What do you choose to focus on? Where does your mind go? See, to be pure in heart means that our thought life is pure. And to have a pure thought life means that we can direct our thoughts toward the things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely. Things that are admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. You have that choice before you. Purity is not only about the things that we think about, but it also has to do with the motivations of our heart. Why we do the things we do. In Philippians, we read this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, those who are pure in heart do the right things for the right reasons. There's nothing wrong with looking out for your own interests, but the command is to also look out for the interests of others. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. The question is, why are you ambitious? What's driving your ambition? See, some people are driven to get ahead, but they never stop to ask the question, who are you trying to get ahead of? See, because if your goal is to get ahead of so-and-so to prove that you are somehow better than them, that is a selfish ambition. That is a vain conceit. There's nothing wrong with advancing yourself. There's nothing wrong with seeking a promotion, but the question always is, why are you going for that? Is it to stroke the ego? Or is it to be, is it, is it you're, you're going for it because you want to do excellent work? See, God doesn't just care about the outward things that we're doing. He cares about the motivations of our heart. And it's good for us to ask ourselves, what's driving me? Am I in some sort of strange competition with somebody else that I have to prove myself to show myself to be better than them? Am I driven by that? Or am I driven by the fact that I just want to honor the Lord? And I want to use whatever influence he gives me in the promotions he might send my way so that I might influence others, so that I might be a blessing to others. What is at the heart of what you do? See, to be pure in heart means that we ask ourselves these questions. That we look at the motivations of our heart. See, to be vain, to have vain conceit, isn't just when we look in the mirror a little too long. It is the emptiness or the unfulfillment that comes when we seek our own glory. When we want to look good in the eyes of people, instead of desiring, most of all, that people see the Lord, that people see him through our lives. Again, we turn back to Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This beatitude 
for a Jewish person who would have read this, he would have, he would have understood it and seen it as a fulfillment or an expression of what's found in Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. We sing a song that has to do with this. The beatitude is right in alignment with this psalm. And this psalm expresses the holiness of God. And it's only the pure in heart who could approach God. But we have to remember that the beatitude describes what life is like in God's kingdom. And we need to be careful not to think that somehow we will see God because we've earned the right to see God based on our own purity, because of our own purity of thoughts and our own purity of motives. Instead, it's only because Christ has already washed us. He's cleansed us. He has purified us that we could stand in the presence of God. When uh, Peter stood before the church leaders in Jerusalem to explain how God had opened the door to the Gentiles to receive God's gift of grace through faith in Christ, he said this in Acts 15, 8-9, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them as he did to us. He made no distinctions between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. See, it's God who purifies our hearts. And it's because of what he initially does for us that we could then present to him a heart that is pure. How does that work? See, when we think of our salvation, we have to think of it in terms of the already and the not yet. We think of our salvation in terms of justification and sanctification sanctification, as well as glorification. We think of it in terms of what God has done already in us and for us, and then what he's continually to do, continues to do in our lives. So it's an event and it's a process as well. That we could stand justified before him, declared not guilty, and in the vernacular that we're using in this passage, we could stand pure in heart because God has made us pure in heart by washing us through the blood of Christ. And yet we could then present God pure thoughts and pure motives because of what he's done for us already we can now grow into this idea that our thoughts are directed for the things that are pure and lovely and right. God has done something, and in our response to that, we offer something back to God. So how do we go about presenting God a pure heart? Well, for some of us, our hearts right now need to have that initial purity that only comes by placing your faith in Christ. So if you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you haven't opened up your your life and heart to him, the response today is to say, yes, God. I know my heart. I know that it is not pure. And that's not surprising. That's just speaking the truth. And so for those of you who have not ever accepted Christ as your Savior, there's the opportunity to do so. To say, yes, God, would you purify my heart right now? And he will. In an instant, he will. Because it's not based on what you do, it's based on what he's done. And so there's that invitation. And for those of us who have already received that initial purifying of our heart now how do we walk in purity what can we do to offer a pure heart to god 
in our thought life and in the motivations for what we do. Well, let's begin with this. Maybe today, make the conscious decision to leave this place and speak about somebody else and speak and say the things that are true, that are noble, and that are right. Things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Things that are excellent and praiseworthy about the other person. You may think, wow, nothing comes to mind. <laughs> I'm trying really hard. Nothing comes to mind. See, but you have to, what it, what it says is think about these things, ponder these things, reflect on these things. Something may not come to mind right away, but if you spend a little bit more time, something will come to mind. You may even have to go to, I like their shoes. They wear great shoes. That's where you start, but continue to think. Continue to ponder. What is it about, about this person that I really see and I appreciate about them? Speak those things out. Get used to exercising this muscle of affirmation. Get used to it. Practice it. Say these things. Say these things about your parents. Say these things about your children. Say these things about the person you're in conflict with. See, when you're in conflict with somebody, what we do oftentimes is we think the worst about them. We go over all their faults, all the negative things that they do, and what we need to do is just shift that and say, you know what, though? There are some things good about this person. There are some things that I need to see that I've not seen and call out. I got to tell you, if you learn to do that, it could change the way you do life. It could change your heart. It changes the peace you feel in your soul. You know, there are times when I feel like I'm a victim. There are times when I'm at home and I think, why am I the only one working hard? And you know what I think? In, in those moments, I think you're stupid, man. <laughs> I think, wow, when I think about how much Rita does for me and my family, when I go there and start to reflect upon all that, I stop feeling sorry for myself. See, we could, in, in, it's amazing. You could do this. Things could change like in an instant if you just learn how to direct your thoughts. If you start to recognize what are the godly thoughts and what are the ungodly thoughts. And when I start going down the road of ungodly thoughts, I could recognize it and I could choose then to turn from that. Because God's word says, and if he commands us to do something, then you are able to do it under the power of the Holy Spirit. So by choosing to focus in on the things that are true, the things that are noble and right, the things that are lovely, those things that are excellent and praiseworthy and admirable, man, we could do this. And it will change everything. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. And I'm going to invite us to stand as we continue in musical worship. At Cornerstone, we love to make prayer available to everybody. And so uh, on the sides here and in the back there, we're going to have um, folks with these glow sticks and they're intercessors. And they're, the, they're here to pray for you. Um, you may have a specific need today uh, that you'd like prayer for. You may just want to receive a blessing. And so we would love to bless people. And call upon God's favor upon your life. I think that's especially appropriate as we talk about 
uh, this whole series of, of uh, who God blesses. And so if you uh, would like to receive a blessing, please feel free to come up and, and uh, receive that. Today also, um, if you feel like you're in transition right now, uh, maybe you're getting a new job, maybe you're entering into a new relationship, maybe you're just coming out of a relationship, and you just feel like you'd like to receive um, uh, a prayer uh, over that situation, uh, we'd love to pray for you. So we have intercessors. If, if you're in the back, if there's intercessors back there, if you could move forward and give them some privacy, that would be great. Uh, let me pray for us right now. Lord, I thank you so much that you are a God who blesses. Thank you that you care so much about us that you want to bless us. Lord, and you want us to bring to you a pure heart. Father, I pray for our thought life, the things that we fill our minds with, Lord. And maybe there are some things that we need to say no to. Maybe even more importantly, the things that we need to say yes to. Father, help us to fill our minds with the things that are true and noble and right. Things that are pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. May these things fill our hearts and minds. And then may we speak these things out in our conversations as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We do love you. And we want to offer you a pure heart. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.